Well, thank you once again for joining us on the program. I am Fola Shade Ogrinde. Interesting facts have emerged about Nigeria's economic status. At the public presentation on the performance of the 2021 budget and the 2022 appropriation act, the Minister of Finance, Zinab Hamid, on Wednesday revealed that the federal government spent over 70% of its revenue to service debt in 2021, while maintaining that the level of the federal government is still within sustainable limits. The minister added that the 2022 budget's deficit is 6.39 trillion naira for 2022, which represents 3.46% of GDP and would be financed mainly by borrowings. Well, joining me to discuss this further is Professor Ken Ife, the Chief Economic Strategist at ECOS Commission. Thank you very much for joining us on Money Matters. Now, let's begin with the 2021 budget appraisal. The Finance Minister revealed that FG spent 4.2 trillion naira on debt servicing between January and November 2021. Now, from the 5.51 trillion naira revenue generated during the period under review, how worrying is this really? Well, that was as at November. <clears throat> Normally, the government finishes strongest in December. So that 70% may well come down to just over 60% um, by the time you, the figures come out in, in January. But I think um, uh, what is important is that this year, they have projected that it will come down to 34% of, of the government revenue. So we need to put that, that um, disappointing result behind us. 34% um, is a good one because there is an increased revenue. You must have been seeing projections of 10.7 trillion revenue this year, uh, partly due to all kinds of emergency measures in the strategic revenue growth initiative and also the uh, PIA. PIA has given so much hope to us uh, of increasing government revenue. So all this whole strategy to move revenue from 7% of GDP to 15% of GDP can only be bode well us in the future. Now, experts have um, continuously advocated reduction in government spending, but the minister categorically stated that cutting down expenditure isn't feasible. What do you make of this? Well, you know, you, you cut this to, a, a, to the position where they may not even be effective anymore. Um, it depends on what expenditure you're asking them to cut. Is it revenue expenditure? or capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is where we have the hope of creating jobs. And the good news, of course, is that in this budget, there is a, an increase to 35% uh, capital expense, which is the highest we've seen uh, since the, uh, the seven years of this administration. 35% is a very high number. But what that tells you is that 65% is used for other things. Um, the, the public only gets a look in from the 35 percent used in uh, uh, in the capital expenditure in terms of creating employment, but then the other 65 percent is consumed by the bureaucracy and, of course, some other essential government services that that have to be rendered. So it's a good news that we are going to be coming uh, forward with 35 percent capital expenditure. But if you talk about controlling government expenditure, Orosanya report has pointed to some of the ministry that need to be merged, some that are redundant, and some of those. So I know they are working through that. It's not easy, um, but I know they are working through that. And that would be one way in which they can reduce or rationalize uh, government expenditure. The other one that people easily point to is the National Assembly. I'm not really sure we can get much more mileage from reducing the cost of the National Assembly. I'm not sure. Uh, because if you divide that cost by the 208 million people, it's not really a lot it's with you. But I think we can demand more from the National Assembly in terms of service. But they have actually done very well. Uh, in the last four years, uh, three years, they've worked hand, uh, hand in glove with the Ministry of Finance and the administration to produce constant um, finance act every year, they, they are on their toes now on pounding uh, the, the agencies into submission to increase their remittance to the, uh, cap, uh, to the consolidated revenue fund. So I think they are proving their metal. 
and we, we need to encourage them. Now, Professor Ken, uh, uh, what do you make of actually uh, the presidency cutting down um, spendings? Because um, over the years, th th there's been a lot of advocacy for for presidents and um, majorly people in power to, to cut down on salaries and other expenditure, which some people feel are basically unnecessary. Uh, do you think um, the, the government can look into that aspect in order to um, you know, mop up excess funds, basically? Well, if you talk about the administration cutting down, yes, there are a lot of scope for the administration to cut down costs. But I'm not too sure whether that cost is going to be cut from the military budget. The military budget is about 2.2 trillion, and it is a necessity because we, you know, insecurity is an existential problem in Nigeria. If they don't have enough resources, then we could be overrun in a matter of weeks, just like in Afghanistan. So much, of, much as we would want to reduce that cost, but there are essential requirements for them to persecute the, the conflict, the asymmetric conflict in all the four, uh, six geopolitical zones. But in terms of governance in general, yes, there are scope. That's why I was saying that Orosanyo report has actually appointed to so many ministries that needed to, that are redundant, agencies that are redundant. And that's really where we should start our court. But definitely, uh, security is um, one which um, is a particular problem that um, um, Nigerians would really love the government to, to find solutions to. But um, some people have actually advocated that um, governments cut down on spending, especially in terms of salaries of, um, of the presidency. That's what I want you to react to, basically. I'm, I'm not sure their salary are bogus, honestly. In the critical area for cost reduction is in the hemorrhage in our uh, uh, money through transfer pricing. Uh, and then you have um, so many loopholes that if you can plug them, the government will be awash with money. There are waivers, custom waivers, duty waivers that are just so much, too much, that we need to start cutting back on those. And then there are uh, expenditures that are not necessary. That you know, but I don't think the where you are going on salaries of of civil servants or you know, I'm not sure that is where we are going to get the mileage. All right, um, the the minister in that presentation said, and I'm going to quote her. Having witnessed two economic recessions, we've, we've had to spend our way out of recession, uh, which contributed significantly to the growth in the public debt. Are there other options we could have explored rather than spending our way out of recession? Well, the thing is, the, the recession caught us off guard. And that meant that many companies, remember there was a shutdown on, on the economy. And when the companies were shut down, there's nothing you can expect the companies to do. The investment meltdown followed. And so we were left with government and central bank and fiscal authorities to quantitatively respond. And they did with, with an economic sustainability plan of 2.3 trillion and then a, a, a monetary policy response of 3.5 trillion. So that was necessary. And that had to come from government to, to, to re-energize the, the economy and stop the redundancy and put money to households so that households can increase the spend. And so, so that fight was what really, and coordination was what brought us out of recession within a quarter. Now, the thing is that now that many of the sectors have returned to pre-COVID uh, growth level, then we are now in a position to begin to normalize our monetary policy, begin to target inflation, and then begin to manage down the uh, money supply. Because whatever you say, there was mo there is money supply issue. You know, a lot of money was put in to fight inflation. A lot of borrowing took place. So we have to begin to manage it down. And you know that many countries, and virtually every country in the world, is having suffering high inflation. Uh, and then that's why you are also going to see quantitative easing ending in many countries led by American European countries. And then you also see gradual increase in the in the rates um, on, on from their side. So all of those uh, statutory forbearance that the central bank granted the commercial banks at the onset of the COVID will now have to begin to normalize because from 10%, 9% to 5%, they're going to go back, as you know, this February to 10% to 9%. And then that's how they will gradually begin to 
to to uh, uh, cushion the the effect of of excess liquidity in the system all right um, professor ken it's been a pleasant first half conversation but we need to take a breather and we'll be right back after this break just stay with us <laughs> Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I've been discussing the major highlights of the 2022 Appropriation Act. And my guest has been Professor Ken Ife, the Chief Economic Strategist at ECOS Commission. Well, thank you very much for staying with us. Now, to ramp up revenue, the federal government is looking into more taxation. But of particular interest is the excise duty on carbonated drinks and other non-alcoholic beverages. How much of an impact do you think this will have on the manufacturing industry? Increase of 10, 10 naira in one liter of, uh, of beverage. The question is how much is a liter of beverage? Uh, quite substantial. So I don't actually see that 10, 10 naira as, as anything, that any cause for alarm. But you have to think on balance. Who is really gaining? The population is exposed more with the sugar-loaded um, carbonated drinks. So you can see a health hazard there in uh, high diabetes and all kinds of things. Uh, and, and so the, the, the government has the health of the country at, at heart in moving in that direction. So uh, it's a necessary direction to go to cut down on all the health sources, sources of health hazard and health risks. But, but, but you know, obviously there's nothing you would do that industry will not respond to. So I hear, I hear the man saying that he's going to take away some investment, it's going to affect their, so I, I, don't, I don't really believe that. Because the, what we are talking about, the margin is really small. All right. So the minister said the government is uh, raked in as much as um, 1.104 trillion naira from independent revenue as at November 2021. What do you make of this? I think that was good, actually, because I remember that in um, <coughs> not too long ago, I think in 2016, it was a, it was a very small figure then, um, about just less than 300, I think 3 to 400. But now it's gone up to 1.1 trillion. And I believe that if we if we continue to rein in on the agencies, uh, especially those on the scheduled list, that that money can come up to 1.6 trillion. I, I, I strongly believe that we could be heading to 1.6 to 2 trillion on that independent revenue. It is a very major source of revenue for, for government because government is guaranteeing all these loans that are being spent by the agencies in various uh, works that are doing. And so if government is funding you, then you have to be you know, uh, making some contributions to enable government defray some of those loans and service those loans that they have taken. So it makes sense. Uh, if your government is funding 100%, then you should be sending 100% of the revenue to the consolidated revenue fund from where you can get uh, something. If you are if you are getting part part support, then you also have um, the operating surplus and also the fifty percent uh, uh, limit on on capital ex on, um, on on expenditure of the turnover. There's a fifty percent limit which has actually triggered a higher uh, rise in in that independent revenue. And then there is the 20 percent clamp down if you are unable to uh, produce your regular quarterly remittance of 80% operating surplus, then they could clamp down on your revenue and be deducting 20% as source. So all of these measures are coming uh, in hand, you know, to help boost the revenue. But I think it's, it's about time that the agencies take this matter very seriously because I've been to Senate hearing to see the Senate chair and the Senate subcommittee on uh, finance pouring venom on, on uh, agencies that, that have their hands on the tail. 
and, and I think they'll need to take note because I have seen the revised um, fiscal responsibility 2007 where the penalties have been so tightened up. You are looking at imprisonment of one year. You are looking at fine of one million plus imprisonment. And it's not saying um, agents know it goes for the officer. So it's going to be a very, very rough time indeed. Hmm. So, so definitely, um, we could see uh, a situation where NDAs are actually uh, remitting uh, this much-needed fund uh, for the government. But let's take a look at um, 2021 in retrospect. What factors are behind a quicker-than-expected economic recovery? Well, the economic recovery came because, as I said to you, massive re response, and it was timely. The money was spent without blinking your eye, because it was an existential problem. COVID, COVID was a matter of life and death, and we couldn't spare resources. Security, insecurity was an existential problem, a matter of life and death. If we had to buy the aircraft, then we had to buy the aircraft. If we didn't have the savings, then we have to borrow. So that was the, the two. But of course, also, unemployment was also in, in the same category of existential problem, because for you to have youth unemployment of 50% compared to the average of 33%, and then you have underemployment of 20%, add both of them is about over 70%, then this is crisis waiting to, uh, you know, is, um, is a crisis waiting to uh, happen. And then if you want to look at how do you compare, what do you compare with? In Tunisia, they were somewhere around 15% unemployment rate not long ago when one of the young men just went couldn't have it didn't want to put petrol on himself and, and put it on fire and when, what was the outcome the whole of the north countries in the north africa all of them went went ablaze and then now we are five times more unemployment compared to what happened in tunisia then so we don't want that kind of thing to happen in nigeria and so we must if we have to borrow to provide economic opportunity to provide employment and the law says you borrow for capital expenditure which is where you find the jobs um, and then also for human resource development and that's where you're looking at health education employment training capacity building to improve our human resource look you must invest in human resource after all you are getting 26 billion dollars from the Nigerian diaspora is that not human resource development you know that we've got to make sure we spend to get to that level where these people can give us the returns. Now, what are your expectations for 2022? Uh, do you see the economy recording further improvements? No, the economy is moving, uh, uh, in a, it is going to be in a better shape in 2022 for so many reasons. And all of these reasons have been captured in the National Development Plan heading up to 2025. And what are the key factors? Oil has been predicted to be as high as 70 to or up to 88, 85% over the next three years. That's the prediction. Uh, and the, even American Energy Information Agency is also along that line. So that means we are now confident that we are, going, we are not going to have the exogenic shocks in the oil price over the next three years. That's number one. So that means the revenue expectation would help um, the the strategic revenue uh, growth initiative to bring back our our revenue. So that's that's hopeful. Then you also saw what the PIA has done, has created more vistas of opportunity. So that also going to uh, boot well. And then also Nigeria, one of the reasons why the growth will continue is because the recovery of many countries in the world are also increasing, the economic recovery is increasing the demand for crude. And at the same time, there is a drop in the investment in exploitation and exploration of, of crude around the world. At a time when Nigeria is even moving in the opposite direction, we've often allocated 30% of our hydrocarbon tax to frontier business uh, exploration. So we are going to be exploring more. We are more confident that we could meet our production vo volumes and targets because we are going to have more wells. So in, on those counts, we are safer. Then also the Dangote refinery is likely to come in soon. And the moment it comes in is a game changer. 
it's going to start saving us all this 1.2 trillion we are spending on subsidizing petrol and all kinds of things. So there is more resilience for our economy. Then the overall growth plan is uh, is, is positive, we are ranging about 55 percent uh, to 2025 uh, annual annual uh, in, uh, growth rate. It's going to be that more much. So there are so many factors that are convergent, uh, that are converging and, and are positive uh, going forward. Now, one of the economic bills passed um, in 2021 is the Petroleum Industry Act, the PIA. Um, and the, the very, very interesting part uh, in that, in that um, act is that um, come 2022, which we are in already, um, Nigerians will pay more for premium motor spirit. They might pay as much as 300 naira per liter. Now, uh, the, the NLC are threatened um, to, to go on strike to protest um, the impending increase in the cost of um, petrol. So this is 2022. Do you not think um, this would have adverse effects? Experts have told us that um, in the long run, Nigerians will benefit from um, the removal of fuel subsidy. But um, how soon should, would, should we expect, basically, um, the benefits of um, the full implementation of the deregulation of the oil and gas industry? Well, you know that most products have been deregulated. Kerosene, diesel, it's just the PMS. And, um, and there's always that contention around the PMS. But we do know that you don't subsidize consumption. What you subsidize is production. When you subsidize production, if there's a need for subsidy, then you are promoting jobs, you're promoting local content, you are you are exploiting your natural resources to generate what you need, and you can even export some of your of your surpluses. So that's a wrong principle, economic principle, to continue to subsidize. Now the Act, Petroleum Industry Act, has provided for deregulation of that that sector. And then also removal of the subsidy. So it's, it's already on the on the plan. It's about how it is going to be implemented. I have personally advised, you know, that um, we have to have a gradual phase down, and then we, uh, you know, that that recognizes the capacities of all the stakeholders, uh, and then that it has to be a multi-stakeholder approach. First of all, what we are talking about is a business between federal government, state government, and local government. That's federation account business. So you go to the beginning, you got to get them involved in that thinking. Then secondly, there are so many players in this whole political economy that you have to engage. You have to engage the labor. You have to engage the uh, current um, uh, Dangote that is big player now in this business. You have to engage the modular refineries that have been given license some of them are, are, kick, are kicking in now. You have to engage the refine, existing refineries. You have to engage the marketers, all your marketers. These guys have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in building tank farm. And don't think that they are going to be idly looking at you uh, run down their business. So they have to be part of the solution. Otherwise, they will be part of the problem. So when you have that multi-stakeholder approach, they get them to define their forward capacities. And then you see how quickly you can bring this down. It has to be a staged phase down of, of the subsidy and the supply. For example, if we if we hope that by next year our uh, our import of fuel will reduce to about 50 uh, uh, million barrels, uh, sorry, liters, then you are hoping that another 40 is going to be coming in from local production. So you have to stage that. And also, government should say to the oil marketers, I can only allow you to import PMS if you can show me the refinery, the modular refinery that you are, uh, that you are, yeah, where you are producing refined product in Nigeria. This was what done in cement. That was how Dangote became an octopus in cement. Obasanjo said, whoever wants to import clinkers, come and show me the factory where you are going to be processing cement. And that was how he went. I think we're going to have to do that in the oil. Let them have a commitment to produce, refine some products locally, and then they will they will be allowed to import over the over the phase down transition period. And in that way, you will get the commitment of all stakeholders involved, and and it will not be a major crisis in the country. If you take a one singular approach, then everybody you will be on your own because the labor will strike, union will join them, 
all the hoodrums will join and take over, hijack the whole process. It's no longer a peaceful protest. Before you know it, they're burning all the government properties in all the states. Mayhem will reign. And you don't want that because we expect the government to finish strong. And, and they, they have a good budget. They have a good development plan. We are praying for them to finish strong and not to be tempted at a unilateral measure that could you know, fall flat on everybody's face. And let's talk about another uh, bill, another economic bill that was passed in 2021, which is the Finance Act. Now, uh, how much of an impact or how significant is this bill in um, helping the federal government drive up revenue through taxation? Yeah, it's actually a bill that is targeted at getting more revenue from the government because it has looked to um, bring more automation in the FIRS uh, tax collection and tax administration and automation is the answer if you take if you take if you look at the states why is lagos so successful because of automation lagos has so automated that you as an individual can just enter the system and declare your own tax and then and then get your certificate issued automatically and you rock and roll then after some time they may now have to come and have a look you sit down with a tax officer and then they say oh look at what you've been doing you know uh, the similar person doing the same business, the same turnover, actually pay three times more tax in uh, Idi Araba. Uh, you know, and so they sit down, and they just after two or three years sit down, and by the time you you finish talking through, you know, they will get more money from you. So, so we need to get more automation. And secondly, there are also issues about foreign uh, businesses, you know, under service um, uh, trading services. You can have um, mode one, mode two, mode three. You could be in, in South Africa and you are using tele telecom services in Nigeria. I mean, get an example is the GSTV, that type of thing. But then how much tax are you paying? Because the, the tax principle is that tax has to be paid in the country where you make profit. So then the second person is that somebody may come in here to the country and do a business and bugger off without paying tax. So we need to make sure we capture something. Then the third one is when they are right down your country, living a resident in the country, and then doing the service. So they have to also pay tax. So they are now opening the they're increasing they're increasing the dragnet to ensure that tax can be collected from all modes of, of service provision. So I think that was that's very encouraging. And then of course you mentioned the the tax that they are putting on uh, non-alcoholic sugary drinks and uh, and many others, and you know expanding the tax base. And plugging more holes and, and leveraging uh, other technology and automation to ensure that we can get more money out of the out of the uh, system. Well, indeed, um, it's been a pleasant conversation. Many thanks, Professor Kenny Fay, Chief Economic Strategist at ECOWAS Commission. Thank you very much for your contributions. And it's a wrap on the program. Many thanks for watching. I am Flashadi Ogurinde. Bye for now.